Welcome to the Sourcing Hero podcast produced by UNA, a group purchasing organization that empowers sourcing heroes and Art of Procurement, the world's largest procurement podcast network. I'm your host, Kelly Barner. The goal of the Sourcing Hero podcast is to capture the epic stories of people who are rising up and beating the odds to create exceptional value within procurement directly from those heroes themselves. Today, my guest here on the Sourcing Hero podcast is Lamont Robinson. Lamont is a committed leader in the supplier diversity effort, and he is currently the director of supplier diversity at Amerisource Bergen, a global healthcare company. He has been widely recognized for his passion and innovative work in the supplier diversity space, and so we are thrilled to have him with us on the podcast today. Lamont, thank you so much for being here. Kelly, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Appreciate it. Now, I shared a little bit in my intro what you're best known for, but I didn't really talk at all about your experience. Can you share a little bit more about your background and and time that you've spent working professionally for anybody that hasn't met you previously? Sure, sure. So, you know, initially I thought I wanted to be an accountant. So that's where my career started. I, it started in accounting until I had my first internship. And then that's when I realized that I needed a different profession. So, <laughs> <laughs> so my, I really cut my teeth uh, while working at Abbott Laboratories in their corporate uh, procurement department. So purchasing was really the first profession that I had. And while I was at Abbott, the, uh, the leader of their supplier diversity program was about to retire. And he he saw me present and there was something about me that he thought uh, he wanted to mentor. And so he approached me about this thing called supplier diversity. And uh, once he told me about it and he invited me to attend a conference in Chicago, which is where I lived at that time, uh, I I just fell in love with it. I had never heard of it before. And then when I went, it's just one of those epiphanies that you have that, you know, uh, you're home. And, And so you know, I, I had been struggling before that, even though I, I have greater success in procurement than I did at accounting. Uh, I just knew that it wasn't going to be long term for me. Mm-hmm. And so I, when, I, when I found out about supplier diversity, it really captured everything that I wanted. Uh, procurement, uh, marketing, HR, sales, operations, I just a lot of things were, were really enveloped in this thing called supplier diversity. And so I did not get a chance to um, to take over the supplier diversity program at Abbott because I was then uh, part of a, uh, a, uh, a situation where Hospira broke off from Abbott and uh, divestiture. And so being a part of that divestiture, uh, it allowed me to do some supplier diversity, but for the most part, I was responsible for the procurement for most of the professional services. So that really took away a lot of time that I could have used for supplier diversity. So I knew that I had to find a job that would allow me to be able to do more in supplier diversity. So then comes my experience at Cardinal Health. So Cardinal Health is where I cut my teeth in supplier diversity. And it was amazing. I worked for a lady called uh, named Kathy Ben. And Kathy really not only educated me about supplier diversity, but more importantly, she taught me how it could be integrated within a uh, corporation, specifically within sales. So uh, I worked at Cardinal doing that. And then the, the opportunity came for me to go to a company called uh, Novation, which was uh, is now Vizient. And so uh, that required me to move from the Chicago area down to the Dallas area in Texas, which is where I am now in Texas, not in Dallas anymore. And so at Vizient, it gave me a chance to uh, to really lead for the first time a supplier diversity program. So I spent about four years at Vizient, and then I got the opportunity to go to Nielsen, the TV ratings company, for about six years, leading their program successfully. And then, um, and then I went from Nielsen to building my own firm uh, to help corporations establish supplier diversity programs before, as you stated, uh, coming over to Amerisource Bergen to lead their efforts. Now, before we talk in more detail about supplier diversity, there's one of the things that you said that I actually want to pause on for a second, because I think it's really important. You talked about the fact that you fell in love with the concept of supplier diversity. 
And I think that is so important. You know, there are jobs that you can work like jobs and there are careers that you can build up by tacking multiple jobs together. But then sometimes you have the opportunity to professionally follow a calling. And it sounds like that's the opportunity that you've had. Mm -hmm. Why is the cause of supplier diversity so personal for you? Well, for me, uh, it always goes back to where I was raised. So I was brought up on the west side of Chicago in, a, in an underserved community. And in that community, I didn't see a lot of business owners that looked like me. So for me, I didn't think that that was possible for an African-American male to own his, his own company until I saw the TV show, The Jeffersons. And then that's when I saw, oh, wow, we can actually do that. So <laughs> For a television show to change the uh, you know yeah. the dynamics of how I view business and or really more importantly business ownership, uh, I mean that that's critical to really understand and, and just and, and really it says a lot about the lack of exposure uh, that that kids in underserved communities have as far as business ownership. So once I found out about supplier diversity, which is for those that don't know, it's a concept uh, really to to allow corporations and organizations. Uh, spend, you know, purchase products and services from diverse businesses. When we say diverse businesses, we're talking about companies that are at least 51% owned, operated, and controlled by women, minorities, veterans, LGBTQs, and disabled individuals. And so when I realized that supplier diversity could be a way to develop uh, businesses that are in underserved communities, it, it really brought it back to me full circle. And now it was like, wait, wait a minute, I have a chance to help companies in those underserved communities grow, while at the same time providing some type of exposure to kids that grow that are growing up in those types of communities to understand they can uh, own businesses. And I think clearly you bring that passion, but there's also a teeny tiny little piece of that accountant still in there because the framework that you've put together for discussing supplier diversity and helping companies build these programs actually has six C's. So that's very organized. And, you know, I would consider that sort of like, you know, an accountant type trait. So you're putting it into good use by combining it with your passion. Can you take me briefly through the six C's? So I think you have customers, competition, compliance, communities, customization, and costs. That's a big one for procurement. Can -hmm. you sort of take me on a run through what each of those six mean each of those six C's means? Sure. So wh- when I first uh, started learning about supplier diversity, I- I'm, I'm a visual thinker. And so a lot of times I think in buckets. And so I, I hadn't heard any supplier diversity professional explain the-, the business case for supplier diversity. And that is critical. If you can't really thoroughly articulate the purpose of supplier diversity, it's going to be difficult for you to gain any kind of traction to help uh, build the program, especially internally. So for me, my, my mission then was to create something that, number one, was visually uh, appealing, was was uh, easy to articulate, and something that I could remember. You know, I've got short-term memory uh, situations, so... <laughs> Don't we all? If, if I don't create an acronym or, you know, some type of catchy phrase, it's going to be difficult for me to understand. So so for that purpose, I created the six C's. And really, it's the business case for supplier diversity, regardless of what industry you're a part of, regardless of what company you're in. So customer. So a lot of organizations, corporations build supplier diversity programs because of a customer mandate or they have customers that are really pushing them. Uh, and trying to influence them to build a program. So that's that's number one. Another reason why companies build programs is because of communities. They may be in those underserved communities, like I talked about, you know, in terms of where I grew up. And so if they're in an underserved community, you clearly are going to have a community that wants you to engage more with the local diverse businesses. Um, so an, another uh, C is compliance. If you have a government contract, then you're really mandated uh, to support those diverse businesses. But what I'm starting to see is now private sector companies that are starting to put mandates in some of their contracts as well. So that, that's another thing about, about the C. Another C is customization. And so what this means is diverse businesses, a lot of these diverse businesses have, because they're smaller than their larger counterparts in some situations, they have the capabilities of being more nimble. And so because of that, they have the, the ability to be more innovative. And so that's where customization comes into play. So 
companies uh, establish supplier diversity programs so they can tap into that ability to have a, a, a company customize solutions for them because they're smaller, more nimble, uh, more aggressive, you know, in certain situations. Costs. There used to be a stigma associated with supplier diversity where you had, um, you know, people thought that if you did business with diverse businesses, it was going to increase your costs. I, I saw, you know, the experience that I have in the last 18 years, I've seen this just the opposite. You actually have cost savings in doing business with diverse businesses because they don't have the larger overhead than the than their counterparts do. And so that's that's another key reason why you should do business with diverse businesses. And then lastly is uh, competition. A lot of companies are now driven because their competitors have a supplier diversity program, but they don't. And so it's important for you to have one because, number one, if your competitors have it, then if you're going after a potential customer that has supplier diversity programs in place, then it's going to be difficult for you to be able to uh, obtain that business or retain it if you have a current uh, customer. But then also, if you don't have competitors that have supplier diversity programs, building a program could help you to differentiate yourself against the uh, competitors. Well, and it's interesting and excellent. First of all, I was tracking just to make sure you hit all six. There <laughs> are two of the C's that I would like to go back to and get a little bit more detail. The first one is your point about customization. And it's interesting because people say it differently, but I often hear a very similar idea that we're sort of in this magic moment where supplier diversity is getting so much attention from private and public sector organizations, but also everyone is so focused on supply chain resilience right now. Mm -hmm. And so this is sort of an opportunity mm -hmm. for anybody that's either has a brand new supplier diversity program or has had one for a while to add an additional business case onto whatever their mission and vision were previously, that there are many ways whether it's through just working with different companies or like you pointed to that agility, bringing in diverse owned businesses is an opportunity to improve the resilience of the supply chain. Is that also something that that you're hearing or that people ask you about? Oh, absolutely. And, and the thing about it is uh, the, the companies that have best in class supplier diversity programs proactively go after uh, this, in a sense, uh, challenge by developing their diverse businesses. So the, the greater you can develop these businesses and make them into true partners, the more you can integrate them within your supply chain. So I'll give you a great, a quick, great example. When COVID hit in 2020, we started seeing um, significant challenges in terms of being able to get products from overseas, especially those products that that we needed uh, to be able to help the health systems to to uh, defeat uh, the, you know, this dreaded illness here. And so having the ability to develop diverse businesses here in the U.S. allowed some of those best in class supplier diversity programs to tap into those diverse businesses. Well, and even to that point about, you know, transition us right into cost, which is something that procurement organizations and professionals are always going to be hyper focused on. You know, there's sort of the old way of looking at cost, which is, okay, how many pennies does this widget cost? How many widgets do I need? And so therefore, what's the extended cost of this supplier versus another? But I think, or I would like to think, I'll leave this open. I would like to think that procurement has learned enough about value and competitive advantage and market share and all of these things over the last few years that cost has expanded into the idea of total cost. And that if we can expand our notions around how we look at cost and compare suppliers, because it's it's really the more value oriented a supply relationship is, the more difficult it should be to build out that grid of cost, right? Because there should be all of these qualitative factors involved as well. Do you see a correlation between the organizations that have most embraced the opportunity associated with supplier diversity and then the organizations that also take more evolved, bigger picture approaches to measuring and tracking costs? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so again, my, my background is procurement. And so I clearly understood the uh, the total cost of ownership versus just looking at the uh, the fee, you know, if you will. Uh, so from that perspective alone, anytime I build a supplier diversity program, I try to incorporate, again, that development 
uh, piece to it that would allow us as a corporation to educate diverse businesses on total cost of ownership. And for them to understand that when you're going after opportunities, don't just put your cost out there in terms of the bottom line, but also talk about that total cost of ownership because there is great value in a corporation understanding that. So so absolutely, you see a t- the top organizations that that get TCO uh, that are uh, that have supplier diversity programs that are finding ways to bring the two together so that um, it's not just about that initial cost, but it's about the cost over the lifetime of the product. And so, uh, again, you know, we, we talked about tapping into those diverse businesses that are that were especially here in the U.S. So logistically, you're able to not only support a, uh, a diverse community or an underserved community, but guess what? You get your products much faster uh, which which helps with that TCO as well. I think the piece of it that's, and maybe this is sort of a, a next step or a next level of commitment to the idea of supplier diversity. I know this is something that I worry about is that when within procurement, we do have a reputation for being a little bit insular, right? We, we hang out with each other. We speak the same language. Nobody else understands us. Um, so when we talk about supplier diversity, we have a tendency to all sit around together as procurement professionals or as supplier diversity directors and managers and discuss how well we're doing and what else we think we could potentially do. But I don't feel like there are enough opportunities for, and I know this isn't necessarily a thing because it crosses so many industries and sectors, but if there were a way for the voices of diverse owned businesses to sort of come together and say, listen, it doesn't matter what product or service we provide. This is the experience that those of us who are diverse owned businesses who are trying to grow and create opportunities for our employees and for our communities through these supplier diversity programs, there's some things you may not know about the realities of the other side of your supplier diversity program. Mm -hmm. What would you say that procurement professionals and teams need to know about how to be good customers when working with diverse owned businesses? Well, uh, great question. And first of all, I think um, the the first thing is, if you have a supplier diversity program, you need to be a part of the, the main diversity advocates that are out there because they are creating those platforms for those diverse businesses to come together and, and really state their case to these corporations. So organizations like the National Minority Supplier Development Council or the Women's Business Enterprise National Council, the National Gay uh, Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, these, these are organizations that are trying to find ways to build web- webinars or, or, or have conferences where you could have diverse businesses talk about uh, the value that they add. And then it's up to, to, to your point, it's up to those uh, the, the procurement groups within corporations to really see it differently. Uh, to not just see this as you know some type of cost center, to see it as a, a way to establish true partners, and then even and, and I've seen in certain situations too, uh, you know you have uh, diverse businesses uh, become very successful and acquired by some of these businesses. Yeah. You know, obviously it, it it doesn't help the diversity spend for that organization, but what it does is it it, uh, it it helps with that American dream. When you build the business, it becomes attractive enough for a company to to, to acquire. So so I've seen it in different elements, but but definitely uh, having the, the, the procurement group really truly understand the, uh, the importance of supplier diversity and how you can develop these, uh, these partners could help with that. Now, we went through your six C's, but I know you're very active in the community. You're constantly speaking. You, know, you graciously accepted this invitation to be on the Sourcing Hero podcast. You meet with people. And as you mentioned, you meet not just you know being involved with minority-owned businesses, you are working with, which I think is wonderful about the diverse-owned business community, women-owned, veteran-owned, LGBTQ-owned. I love the fact that everybody's kind of coming together, even if the certifications are still currently somewhat separate. Mm -hmm. Do you think six is going to be the fixed number of Cs, or is there potential for some growth to your framework? Oh, it's definitely uh, potentials. I'm I'm already um, looking at a couple of others. Uh, that I'm looking at. One, one is change management. You know, I think oh, that's um, a good one. Yeah, supplier diversity is more about change management than anything. You know, procurement is about change management. When you think about it, my my first uh, job that I had, or or first project that I had when I was at Abbott uh, in procurement, was to change the uh, the bottled water 
And so you would think that it's a simple task, right? You know, you would think that there's really no no choices that folks are are, are uh, <laughs> attached to. I was wrong, you know. So <laughs> we were using about I think five or six different providers of bottled water, and I got it down to one had significant cost savings. And I couldn't tell you the amount of uh, emails that I got from folks complaining about the the taste of water, even though they had a, a water fountain right next to it for free. Um, so, <laughs> so change management and procurement is huge. Uh, and it's something that we really need to look at, you know, in terms of uh, another C added to uh, to supplier diversity. Well, and it's so funny you mentioned the the water. Um, I know you know Philip Eidson at Art of Procurement. Certainly he's been here on the Sourcing Hero podcast. He actually has a great story that he tells sometimes about back when he was a practitioner. He It was his job to source the French fries that were going to be served in the cafeteria, although forget now where he was working. I potentially should be referring to those as chips. But either way, it almost started a labor riot because everyone was so upset with the taste of the new French fries. It's it's understanding, right? Taking people through that change management process, getting feedback, bringing them with you on the journey. You are absolutely right. Everything that we do, certainly, Mm -hmm. first and foremost, supplier diversity and everything else procurement is responsible for. There's always that somewhat unpredictable and yet at the same time, so predictable human change management element that we need to stay on top of. Well, and you really reminded me of another C that I'm kicking around as well, and that's culture. You know, I think um, the culture of an organization will make it feasible to be able to build a successful supplier diversity program. And I think sometimes when we do projects, whether it's supplier diversity or just procurement, we don't take into consideration the impact of a culture before we make those uh, those changes. And so really helping to educate the culture is something that I've always done, especially with my uh, the, the practice that I, I've built. I've always first looked at what is the culture and how can we build a program, a supplier diversity program that integrates within that culture and not looked at something that seems like it's set aside and separate from the organization. No, I, I think that's an excellent point as well. And I actually think as we start to think, you know, culture is such a, a big picture thing, as critical as it is, right, it can be a little bit harder to pin down than things like cost and even even customization. The, the last thing I'd like to ask you, and this is actually a question I put to everyone that joins me here on The Sourcing Hero, is when you think about this idea of heroism, what would you say the idea of a sourcing hero means, or if you prefer to take it from sort of a bigger picture perspective, what does heroism mean in a business context? Oh, absolutely. You know, that, that's a great question. I'm, and one that I've never been asked. So it's you, a hard you, one. I think that's <laughs> tough. <laughs> you know, for, for me, um, you know, I look at a hero, let me, let me back up and just say what my definition of a hero is. So to me, a hero is somebody that makes uh, such a positive impact on a person's life, especially if they're doing something that that person could not do on their own. So to me, that's what a hero is. So a sourcing hero is somebody that is able to look beyond the surface of an organization and to be able to have projects, create projects, uh, make decisions that could positively impact that organization and that is sustainable. So we can have a transactional impact but that's not sustainable. It's something that, you know, you, you, fine, you save a few dollars here, but guess what? The next year prices are going to increase. To me, a sourcing hero is somebody that can look beyond the next five, 10 years and create a, 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 a project or, or establish a partnership with a company uh, that would allow that organization to benefit for years, for both ben- uh, organizations to benefit. You know, I think the old school mentality was always, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to negotiate this price until it goes down to, you know, the absolute bare bones uh, and I win, I win, I win. But but what we need to do is to start looking at ways that allows everybody to win. So that's what a sourcing hero is, is somebody that would allow everyone to win because of the sustained solution that they've been able to build. Now, Lamont, for anybody that's listening in that would like to connect with you, either because they are equally passionate about driving change or whether they're in love with supplier diversity or in love with all of procurement, what is the best way for people to reach out and get in touch? 
Well, for me, I think LinkedIn is always a great platform for me. So if you look up Lamont Robinson, just type in supplier diversity, you should be able to find me. Uh, but LinkedIn is always a, a great way. Uh, I'm not on Twitter as much. Uh, if you are trying to find my Twitter handle, it's La Robbins, L-A-R-O-B-I-N-S, the number one. Um, and then the same for uh, you know Instagram. But for the most part, uh, LinkedIn is, is where I, I love to uh, connect with people. That is great. Lamont, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sourcing Hero podcast. Join us again next time for more true stories of sourcing and business heroism performed by your colleagues and peers. Look for the Sourcing Hero wherever you get your podcasts, and don't forget to subscribe. Finally, don't forget... Sourcing heroism is taking place all around us every day. Keep your eyes open and you're bound to see it. Until next time, I'm your host, Kelly Barner. Stay well and always remember that you can be a hero too.